Welcome into the most rickety KSO Sunday show that you will ever see. Mason Voth, KSU fan, Drew Galloway here with you. And uh, very fitting that the Cats play like crap. So we are in a crappy situation. Fan's the only one that's pristine <laughs> right now. He's got his normal setup. He's at home. He's nice and comfortable. Drew and I, as of 7 o'clock Sunday night, still chilling here in the DFW airport as we wait for a 909 flight uh, to Wichita. We've had plenty of delays today. It's been a, a fun time, and now we get to have even more fun and recap. A disaster last night, 38-9. to K-State lost to BYU. We'll be a little bit quicker uh, tonight, but figured we wanted to at least commit and try and get everybody a show. I'll start with Drew here. Uh, you were there. What was your thoughts on the game itself? We can talk a little bit later about what transpired with Provo and BYU and everything there because I think everybody walked out of there on the K-State side impressed and had a great time, which it's rare that that can be said when your team has that crappy of a performance. But the BYU fans were so incredibly nice. The stadium was awesome. The presentation was great. Um, they knocked it out of the park. That is easily my favorite place that I've ever been in the Big 12. Yeah, it was just all around. Like Provo was super cool, and getting to experience a new stadium I thought was super fun. And, and the presentation, like you said, was really fun and really cool. And it, it was the best environment that I think that I've been in. And I think that it's the, the number one pretty easily. Like it was a really fun experience. And then it was even fun for the first 28 minutes of the game to be honest with you, because K-State was dominating the game, but the score didn't show it because they didn't finish drives. But it was a dominant first three possessions of the game. And then the fumble hits, and you kind of get this feeling of, oh, crap. Like, the, it could be one of those nights. And then Avery throws the interception on a screen play, and then you get the, oh, it's really going to be one of those nights. So the whole experience, really outside of, what we're going through right now and why we're doing this at an airport gate with Mason and I separated by like three rows of chairs. It's been a really positive experience. Like I've never been to Utah and I thought that it was really, it was really pretty and there, the mountains were fun. Uh, but like, honestly, the the game that was as bad as I can remember K-State playing in a non COVID season in a really long time. Yeah. That was kind of the initial takeaway is immediately, Man, when's the last time something was this bad? And it's that COVID season, and that doesn't really count. So I don't know that you can find a great parallel to what happened for K-State. 2021 against Oklahoma State might be the best comparison. But as we know, Skylar Thompson was hurt, did not play in that game. Will Howard got hurt after, like, two series. So Jaron Lewis pretty much had to play the rest of the game. That's where it comes from. But also, like, Oklahoma State had the advantage in every facet in that game. Not – like the game last night where K-State outgained them. They felt like they were in control. They felt like their defense was playing better than BYU's. But ultimately, penalties were a killer and uh, the snowball turning into an avalanche of mistakes. So, Fan, you were at home. Number one, did you stay awake for the entire butt kicking? Uh, and what did you take away from it? I, I did make it through the entire thing, even as painful as it got down the second half of that game. Um, I agree with you guys. Um, I, I think it's unusual. I think the only game maybe I can think of that relates at the time was maybe Fresno State when they came in here and kicked K-State's butt in Manhattan. Just because at the time of the game, we thought we were the much better team. And that, that game just went off the rails. And Fresno State really dominated that game. That was a little bit different. This one was I've never seen a game like this where K-State made so many mistakes. And I still, at the end of the game, think we're the better team. I still think we're more talented. I still think we play those guys 10 times on neutral fields. We probably win eight of them, maybe nine of them. But in this case, in all the bad things that could happen, um, happened. And I've never seen that many bad things happen in a row that fast to a team. And now BYU made some plays. Um, BYU did some good things, but the the number of mistakes K-State made back to back to back to back to bridge that into the second quarter and beginning of the third quarter 
and to just be stunningly uh, behind that quickly is hard to recover from. And I think um, the the inexperience that we kind of knew case they had, especially on the offensive side of the ball, really showed up, I think, in the players and in the coaches as that game progressed. And I really think um, once that snowball happened, you just weren't going to turn it around. And, and I think part of it is, is you, you were playing in front of a great crowd. Maybe, you know, a, you know, we had not quite that bad of an avalanche, but we had bad things happen at Tulane, but because it wasn't that type of crowd, K-State could rebound and overcome it. And that just wasn't going to happen in Provo. And it was the combination too of against Tulane, there were bad things that happened, but you didn't then on the opposite end have another bad thing happen where, K State early, the bad things were similar to Tulane, not finishing drives with touchdowns, even with some promise there. The penalties were a killer. The defense got bit by some big plays, but that came after, you know, the other stuff. K State didn't turn the ball over at Tulane, and they found a way to force turnovers. They had to get Jake Retzlaff to turn the ball over because he's not good at protecting it. They weren't able to do that, which I give the defense a little bit of a pass because it's really tough when you're in that situation, you're com- just religiously put in a tough situation, short field, or you've given up points without even being able to see the field. That's a tough spot to be in, but they weren't able to force a turnover. And the secondary, once again, they struggled when the ball was in the air. They they got beat pretty easily last night. Like they were the guys that needed to step up. Austin Moore said after the game, Hey, look, that, that's our job to go out there and do it. I think there were parts of the defense that tried. Usu Sayamalo had a really good game mm-hmm. last night. Brennan Mott continued a great start to the season. I thought the linebackers were fine for the most part until the, that last touchdown run where they missed some tackles. The secondary, though, looked lost a few times. It was too easy for BYU to catch their big plays. Guys weren't looking for the ball in the air, and it was it was disastrous there. So that's what you had that's different than the two-lane game is everything just compounded. And that, I think the crowd had a major part to do with it. Like, it, it was tough to hear in there at times. And you think about where things went wrong, Typically, when I'm recording the highlights on the field, I'll go to the end that K-State is coming towards. So for the first quarter, I was on the end where the BYU student section was. And so when I would be back there, I'm like, man, this thing's loud. Like, how are they communicating? Well, then I flip in the second quarter. So I'm on the other end where it's just, you know, paid fans, the the, the small K-State section. And you can tell a difference in the crowd noise when you're down there. Like, it was softer on that end. So think of where all the mistakes and where the problems came for K-State. It was in that end when they were within 40, 50 yards from the 20-ish yard line backwards of the BYU students. The crowd was absolutely a factor, and that's a problem when you have a young quarterback, you have a new offensive coordinator calling plays for only the fifth game of his career. You have the guy that's talking in the head to Avery Johnson, only his fourth game at K-State, only his fourth game talking to Avery Johnson. You got a lot of problems there. Come combine that with the fact that it's an inexperienced offensive line in terms of playing together and all that, and you got a disaster. And on top of that, just unfortunate that it all started with something that probably won't ever happen again to DJ Giddens. Like he had never fumbled at K State. It's a weird one how it popped out. It fell right into the spot where BYU could take it to score. Um, and so it was a combination of K State didn't play well. Some weird things happened. And they also shot themselves in the foot to where they couldn't make up for it in enough time to where it snowballed. And once they got down, I, what, it would have been 24 to 6. Um, at that point, even though that's not a big number, you're thinking that's, that's a tough thing to come back from in this situation, especially with how much they struggled to actually get the ball in the end zone. Um, we'll move on. Let's get thoughts on Connor Riley and the performance there. Because, again, that's a lot of the criticism is the play calling. He just doesn't seem to have a feel for the game flow yet. It's disjointed, all of these different things. Uh, What did you make of Connor Riley and the way that plays were called last night? Just real quick, I'll throw this in there. I found it weird. There was very few Avery Johnson runs in the first half, and they decided to start doing it in the second half when it kind of felt like they needed it, but like the game was already kind of out of reach there, and you're risking him getting hurt. That didn't make any sense to me, but I'll, I'll defer to fan here first. Yeah, it's it's perplexing and and tough to judge because on one hand you get the ball the first two drives and you drive it and you're 
even in the midst of driving it, you're overcoming penalties. Um, I think the yardage rate, even after the field goals in the first two drives, was over 90%. So we had we'd gained as about as much yards as you can gain without scoring touchdowns on two consecutive drives. But you get down there, and then you know we've it's been talked about. I'm sure you guys talked about it after the game as well. Um, the 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 few perplexing calls, a run on third and nine, and then on the next drive you get in short yardage situations, and you throw two passes and uh, near the goal line inside the red zone. Uh, obviously, the penalties contributed. I mean, the, the false start um, snap infraction on the first one was just completely unnecessary. Wipes off what would have been a touchdown to a wide open H back in the middle field. And then you get, then you run it in the next play, which is the perplexing part, and settle for a field goal. And then the other one, you get the hold, which would have had, would you had you on second and short if you don't have that hold. So it's tough. And then after that, you know, I, I think that first drive when it's 6 3 at the end of the second quarter, I, I think Kleiman kind of has a yardage and time factor. I don't know if he has a chart or if it's just in his head. And he's saying, if we can get to the 40 and still have a minute left or a minute 15 left or a minute 20 left, then we're going to turn it loose. And I think that's kind of the mode he was in. I didn't mind the run right before the two minute timeout. And then even a run right after that, I didn't mind trying to get out to the 40, but then you just have disaster happen because you're playing safe. I mean, that's the funny thing is because you're playing safe, the disaster happens, what you're, what you're trying to prevent, prevent by playing safe. And then the next drive, I mean, I, I, people are upset because they thought, well, why are we passing? Well, he threw a screen. I mean, a screen is about as safe a play as you can have. And the, the funny thing is, is I think what contributed to Batty being possess, in position to, to intercept the ball was they were playing kind of a zone blitz and having two guys spy Avery Johnson on both those drives. And he just happened to be in exactly the right spot because he dropped instead of rushing the passer. And so – you get a completely goofy situation where you throw right into a zone blitz to a defensive lineman um, because you're throwing a safe screenplay that 99% of the time is not picked off. And so just disastrous to have those two things happen. Uh, you just simply can't give up a defensive score and then two 30-yard 30, 30 drives and then a special team score. I, I would guess if you went through the history of college football and the teams gave up two non-offensive scores and two 30-yard drives, they probably have never won a game, I would guess. Yeah, and 25% of them probably belong to Bill Snyder. So, <laughs> you know, in terms of the good the good side yeah, of it, the good, uh, yeah. that, might, that might be the first time since the 70s or 80s that K-State's been on the wrong side of it. Yeah, that, that was not good. Drew, what were your thoughts on Connor Riley and the K-State offense? Kind of like echoing uh, fans' sentiment that the first two drives I thought were pretty solid outside of just the head scratching plays, and I think that sometimes that Connor Riley has tried to get a little bit too unpredictable, and it has kind of forced the K State offense to not really have a rhythm. And I'm right there with you about a screen as a safe pass play, but the perplexing thing to me is how K State was very insistent to run the clock out if they could on the drive before, but, and then that leads to the scoop and score, but, but passing on first down mm -hmm. and having it being complete was the one that was confusing to me. And one where if you're going to kind of do this over, you probably just take a knee and go into half. Like the snowball probably doesn't happen and you don't, you never know how much the outcome kind of changes, but you end up going for it and be aggressive and you end up having a big mistake. And it's really easy in that situation to go into the locker room and say, Hey, look, yeah. didn't play well. We, we made plenty of mistakes. We're hurting ourselves here We're we can get in this thing. And also you can say two weeks ago, we were down a touchdown and a field goal at halftime at Tulane. And we came out and we throttled them in the second half and everybody made plays when they needed to make plays. Like everybody stepped up in that game. Like, that's an easy sell to make. And I know it's hard in that situation. And I know most people would have said, no, you got to go. You got to try and, and get something back right now. That would be great. But, Fan and Drew, you're both right. Like, after you 
have that drive where it seems like all right, you're content just letting things play out and DJ fumbles it and it goes for a touchdown, then just say, hey, you know what? We're going to take our licks, take this in the half, come back out and do it because the pressing is when you get into trouble, especially when you have the offensive coordinator that might be unsure of what to do. When you have the young quarterback, when you have the offensive line that is struggling and making these errors, because there's everybody's culpable for what happened on that interception on that screenplay in my mind. I think Avery was too trusting and just kind of threw a blind ball that, hey, Dylan's going to be there. Dylan Edwards looked lost. There was some protection issues on the left side of the offensive line, I thought. Um, whether it was a total breakdown, it wasn't that, but it was – they kind of got manhandled over on that side to where it interrupted, I think, Dylan Edwards and, and some of the elements of that play. And that, to me, is the thing – where that could have been avoidable and just say, we can come back from 17 to six. Cause I think in that moment, if it's 17 to six, or excuse me, I guess it wouldn't have even been 17 to six, it would have been 10 six. Um, you can still really convince yourself that we're going to be fine here. We get the ball first, like all that. Um, and I, it would have been much better for Chris Kleiman to have to take the heat of the fan base and people. If it was him taking the ball into the half 10, six, the score, as opposed to you, you go out there and you make errors and everything just compounded on on Saturday night for K State. I, I don't know why it happened, but it did. Yeah, yeah, that I was uh, just gonna say it's one of the few times I think. Usually, this staff is I think pretty even keel to a fault, and and that leads to being conservative. It's almost like there was a, a small instance of panic after that scoop and score touchdown that we had to go at least get a field goal, I think was probably in their mindset when you're right, Mason, it was 10 to six, like go to halftime, regroup, come out, you get the ball. Even if you go down and settle for a field goal, it's 10 to nine and you're, you're within eight points, even if they score a touchdown. So I, I, I agree with that sentiment. Yeah. The, the, the thing that I was going to add was that, you know, you throw, if you, just go into halftime and you're content at 10-6. Casey was running all over BYU in the first half. You can add more run game instead of feeling you, like you had to throw it more in the second half, which led to more mistakes and, and led to an interception by Avery Johnson that was the worst throw that I've seen him make, even going back to his high school days, because if, if the BYU linebacker doesn't make that play, there's a defensive back that's also right there. Well, and that's one of those things, too, where I mean, you think about, like, kind of what happened to Arizona happened to K-State, where K-State made Arizona feel like they were in this position that they just had to try and get it all back right there, right there, and, and put their offense in that mode as opposed to being able to kind of do what they normally want to. That was kind of the thing for K-State, except for Arizona, you know, their thing is normally a, a lot more patient with their passing. They're going to throw it more than they run it, but – they're going to be more selective about it. They were trying to be bigger and brasher against K-State. Last, last night for K-State, it was they had to go away from the run game. Now, the, the other thing that I would throw in, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but my number one criticism for the offense and Connor Riley last night, and I don't know who's at fault for this. I don't know if it's Chris Kleiman for wanting to keep Avery Johnson healthy or keep him happy, or if it's Connor Riley for, like Drew said, trying too hard to be unpredictable, or if it's Avery Johnson for – I got to prove that I'm a passer. I got to prove that I'm a passer. It's almost like, you know, when people said after Marcus Foster's freshman year, when he went to, you know, all those off season camps or whatever, and they said, well, you got to do this more to make it in the NBA. And it, I mean, he did other things to jack up his sophomore year, but whatever. I don't care who's, who the problem is. At some point, Chris Kleiman and Connor Riley have to step up and say, we're doing what's best for this team. And, the quarterback run has to happen earlier in the game. It doesn't have to be a constant, but it has to be earlier in the game. You can be selective about it because, like I said, it made zero sense to not do it that much in the first half. I don't know exactly. Off the top of my head, I'd say maybe it was three or four in the first half at best, and then they seemed to have a more focused effort to do it in the second half, and it worked in, to some extent. But it was stupid to do that when you were down by 18 points like – why are you putting him in a position now in a game that you're probably not going to win to get hurt and take those hits now when you weren't willing to do it earlier? That was probably the number one thing that bothered me, and uh, I, I still have a tough time figuring out. I think they need to be better about making their decisions, and I think you got three guys right there 
and Kleiman, Riley, and Johnson that they all have to come together, have some unity, and decide that they're all willing to do what's best for this football team. And one of and if one of them isn't, then I think you have to say, well, we got the two thirds majority here. Like, you do what we say, or we're going to be better off one way or the other. And I, I don't care who who you think is at, at fault here. Um, and some of that's not not fair to put on Avery Johnson because we don't exactly know what he wants or everything. I think that some of that is projecting um, and understanding everything. And there's the other thing too. He doesn't have great receivers to work with right now. They're not playing well. Jace Brown and Keegan Johnson were good in, in moments early in that game, in different parts, but there's not a number three. Uh, his tight ends were banged up, everything there. And Connor Riley obviously wants to try to have the passing game involved in some way. And if they're telling him to throw as a young quarterback, he may be standing in there to throw more than he normally would if he wanted to take off the run because he's still trying to say, hey, I'm listening to you. I can I can step up. I can do this. Um, there just has to be some retooling of the way I think all three of those guys' brains work with how this offense is going to look over the next uh, eight games and, and plus that for the, the rest of the season. Uh, yeah, for the, have, oh, go ahead. For the numbers, the first 34 snaps, K State ran three design quarterback runs. The next 20 snaps, they ran six. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, and, and that goes back to what, you know, I thought Colin Klein had a knack for is when we got it in the red zone, that is when Will Howard ran the ball and often scored touchdowns. And we didn't see that yesterday. Um, uh, I think we did see the one the one quarterback run got the hold call, and that uh-huh. was the one the only one in the red zone on the second drive. The first drive, uh, there were not there were not quarterback runs when we got into the red zone. In fact, the first drive there weren't wasn't a quarterback run at all. So, um, yeah, that's that is perplexing, especially to do it when you when you're that far behind, and possibly putting your quarterback in position to take shots. So, I get it. You're you're showing fight, but you're right. I it it is kind of confusing what that mix is going to be and what why that mix was that way in that game. Yeah. Uh, anybody have strong feelings on the defense's performance, or are you both like me, where really tough to grade those guys because they were put in really really tough situations yesterday? Yeah. I, I up until the onslaught. I thought they'd played really well. I thought they'd played well to hold them to a field goal that on the drive right before half. So I thought, you know, 6-3, you know, maybe we try a few things if we get down to field and can get a field goal, great. If not, go into halftime ahead 6-3 and you are you still feel okay. You f- feel like you left some points on the board, but you feel okay. Um, but then, you know, they did give up a couple plays on those two drives, but you're starting at the 27-yard line and the 27-6-yard line or whatever. That's that just puts so much pressure on the defense and and the offense has momentum. You know, that's where I think you get a guy playing a little bit harder, running a little bit faster than maybe he normally would on a route. And those things snowball and and it's hard to to come back for that. So I I really I thought the defense did what it needed to do when when K-State was playing its game. Once it became uh, BYU's momentum and BYU's game, then then K-State was in trouble. Yeah, I think the defense was fine. Uh, I mean, I pointed out that BYU only scored a field goal uh, on just like a sustained drive without anything, and then I had somebody else point out to me that BYU's own offense only crossed uh, only crossed midfield three times the entire game, and K State did it like four or five times. It's like you you just look at it; it was just a very strange type of game. And one that I think is, like we've kind of talked about, is kind of easier to write off because you've never seen a K-State team do that before. So it's almost easier to swallow in that sense of like, okay, they've never done this before of just turning the ball over and allowing two non-offensive touchdowns. That could be like a one-off and like just go get Oklahoma State next week. But there's got to be some soul searching on offense because they didn't help out their defense. And for for the defense, too, I'll, I'll just call him out by name. Keenan Garber and Marquis Siegel will have to play better in pass coverage. I mean, BYU was targeting them almost exclusively in that first half when they actually had to sustain drives. And they were 
they were getting picked on in the in the money downs and that that just can be can't be happening and the the flea flicker play if Marquis Siegel knows where the ball is he had he could pick that off and had plenty of space too yeah yeah i i wrote in uh, player grades that'll come out at some point like we can hear about how much better Marquis Siegel's hands are but he's at least got to put himself in the neighborhood to show that he can catch the ball now because that has not happened yet this year and that has to happen against Oklahoma State because it doesn't matter if it's going to be Alan Bowman or Garrett Rangel or if Mike Gundy has another kid that's just going to pop out of there with shaky hands. They're going to have quarterbacks that are give, going to give you the opportunity when the ball's in the air to get a takeaway, and they will have to capitalize on it next week. So uh, overall, I, I'm not going to say too much about the defense. The lack of the secondary finding the ball at times and making play because the other thing too is it's not just that they didn't force a turnover they only had one pass breakup in the entire game last night like one pass breakup credited to them and it that, happened on the second play of the game yeah vj Payne. it's it's hard to do that's hard to do uh we kind of hinted at it and we'll get ready to wind things down here but i think we're all in agreement that it's a little bit easier I mean, that game sucked, and I think everybody's still pretty hot about it. But it's easier if you think big picture and you calm yourself down that such a weird game, the way it played out, that this can still be a really good team, and this still probably is a good team. They just clearly have some things to work on. Um, Where do you think things go from here? How much of what happened last night against BYU is a teller of what's to come over the next eight games of the regular season? I, I kind of thought the same thing after Tulane, that a lot of the things that happened bad at Tulane were things that probably wouldn't happen against other teams just because of the nature of scouting and knowing your opponent and the kind of the mistakes K-State made. I, I think in general, a lot of that is true about what went wrong at BYU as far as the mistakes made on turnovers for touchdowns and a punt return for a touchdown that was a fluky play that we really even talked about, but was just a completely bizarre punt return that never will. I mean, it's just won't happen again, like not the same way. Um, and then very unlikely K-State gives up two drives of less than 30 yards for touchdowns and another one less than 40 yards for touchdowns, you know, and to contrast that, that second drive, K State's offense actually gained 102 yards and c- kicked a field goal. I mean, if you take out the penalties, they gained 102 yards in a drive and got a field goal. So that's the contrast. BYU had three drives that for touchdowns that were less than K State's longest drive, where they set them for a field goal. As far as how many yards their offense had to gain, which is just mind-boggling to be in that situation. Um, so I, I, but you start to worry about K-State, you know, and we've laughed at this in the past as K-State being known as the discipline team and the commentators even were making the comments that you usually hear during K-State games about being shocked that K-State was making these mistakes. But maybe that's the kind of mistakes this team's going to make too. I mean, that that may be a, a fact that we have to face that, that uh, we're going to make procedural penalties and pre-snap penalties on the road because we just aren't able to handle it very well. And we're going to make some mistakes that lead to easy points for the opponent. I hope it's not common. I don't think it will be. But we do have to face the fact that that could be a flaw for this team. Yeah, last night, K-State, eight penalties, BYU only two in the entirety of the game. Uh, I'll get one last K-State-related question for you guys here. Where does your confidence lie in Kleiman, Riley, Klanderman, because that's the other place that a lot of the fan base has gone, at least over on our, our message boards right now, in terms of uh, a lot of, oh, this this staff isn't cut out for it. You know, we, we saw the the thread about, oh, you know, since the road game, since the Big 12 title game, which, you know, some of those data points are, I, I, I love some of Born Plooper's posts, but some of those data points are a little, you know, whatever. Um, well, where do you sit on that? And we'll start with Fan and then Drew can go after that. Uh, Chris Kleiman is still a very good football coach. He's still a very good fit for K-State. He's doing a good job following a legend. Um, I don't have any overall concerns. I think overall he's an A coach 
for this program and someone we should – until the wheels fall off, and one game is not wheels falling off. One game is one bad game. So I'm not going to freak out about that. Even if you, you want to throw in Tulane not being a great game, we still won the game. So um, I'm fine with that. Klanderman – pretty confident in, even though if you look at the advanced metrics, the offense is still better than the defense right now and almost most of the advanced metrics. But I think that's a little bit skewed probably based on a couple of plays and a couple of opponents. Um, I think Klanderman, I would, my confidence on an A to F scale would be a B. Um, Riley Wells, because I, I still put them together. I think, you know, Riley may be calling the plays, but they're still co-coordinators, and Wells, I think, has a ton of input. I'm still in the middle, C-plus-ish, B-minus-ish. I haven't – I won't throw them out. I think it does take time for coordinators to learn sometimes. I think we've commented about um, Riley Wells struggling with rhythm and sometimes getting the right play calls at the right times. I think that can be learned. I think you can grow into that role. I think that it's not necessarily the case that every office coordinator is going to start greatly. And I think Colin Klein didn't necessarily start great as an office coordinator either. So I'm willing to be patient. I'm not throwing the panic button. No one needs to be fired right now after one game to, to, to call for firings after one, I, even with the expectations for the season, even if we're a much better program and team than BYU and shouldn't lose that game, especially by that margin. It's not time to panic at this point in time. If if we're sitting at four and four in a month or and a half, then we can start having that conversation. But at three and one, I'm not ready to have that conversation. I'll give it to Drew here in just one second. I'll ask one last question for you, fan. This is not you saying that you want it to happen or it needs to happen, but would you be more interested right now in seeing if we knew that Matt Wells was in charge of calling the plays versus Connor Riley, which, which would you lean there? I, part of me likes the experience factor and that he has called plays for some good offenses and with sort of a similar type quarterback and Jordan Love when he was at Utah State. I mean, I, I assume he was still calling all the plays, even though he's the head coach at the point that point in time. But I, I do like that factor, um, and I think it would <laughs> – it would be interesting to have a conversation with Matt Wells about how he thinks Connor Riley's doing, but that's not going to happen, at least in public, and it shouldn't happen. But that would be an interesting conversation um, just because Matt Wells has been there, done that for quite a few years, and Connor Riley's obviously the new guy in the block. So um, maybe maybe I would prefer Matt Wells as the primary prey caller, but we are what we are right now. Yeah, for, for me, it's still full confidence in Chris Kleiman. I, I mean, we were talking in the car, non-COVID year, case it's won eight games at least, and, and I think that that is good enough at almost every single program. Like, there are a lot of SEC teams that I think would crave for that kind of consistency. Uh, Klanerman, still probably in that, like, B-plus range of confidence in it's hard to judge off of last night. And for the most part, K State has been really solid defensively under Joe Klanderman. Connor Riley is still kind of incomplete. I like a lot of what he does and what he brings to the table, but he needs to find that balance. And I think that going forward, that's going to be his biggest challenge and biggest hurdle is to still find a way to have balance and kind of have that feel for the game. And that's the hardest part of being a play caller is just the art of play calling. And when you call this in a certain situation and he hasn't quite mastered that yet. So going forward, that's probably his biggest thing, but I'm not like in the burn it down stage of the offense yet either, because the offense has done some fun and dynamic things too in the, in the last two games. Okay, lady in the airport can shut the hell up. She's been just going forever here. Like, we don't need these announcements for 25 minutes at a time. Uh, here, here's how I would look at it. We were talking while we were hanging around this godforsaken place for hours about Tom Brady in the broadcast booth right now and some of these other guys and why 
why do these networks feel the need to just go to a big notable name as opposed to somebody that might actually be way better at the job? Like, you know, they had Greg Olson in there. And what I said to DY was for most people, they think the way to get instant credibility is by putting a name in there that people know. That's why Tom Brady got this job. That's why Tony Romo got that job. And that's why they aren't as comfortable giving that time to a Greg Olson to where over a couple of years people go, well, shoot, I don't really care what kind of player you were, which was a, a really good one. You're really good at this. I want to listen to you over Tom Brady. It, it's happened with Chris Collinsworth. But the benefit that Chris Collinsworth had was that he was able to kind of pay his dues. He was in that three-man booth with Buck and Aikman. And then he was able to take over in the NBC booth. So people had a little bit of familiarity, but like his broadcasting prowess outweighs even as good of a player as he was. And I think it's the same thing with Connor Riley right now, where we see those flashes. Like we can see, like Connor Riley has an idea of what he should be doing here. He's not a God awful coordinator. Like that's, that should be put out there right now. He's done some really good things this year, but he's still showing that he's raw. And the problem is going to come down to is K-State going to be able and are people going to be patient enough to give him this time to where he can grow? And that's kind of where we're at right now. People are going to have to get used to the growing pain. Same with it being Avery Johnson at quarterback, only making, you know, what, his sixth start last night, uh, or I guess fifth, his fifth start Mm -hmm. last night. It's taking time there. People are a little bit more patient with him, though, because he's a 19-year-old player. He is one of the best recruits K-State's ever had. He is from the state of Kansas. He obviously has an affinity and love for K-State, so people appreciate that. Connor Riley, on the other hand, is this offensive offensive line coach that's never called plays before. People still have this in the back of their head, distaste for Chris Kleiman's background at North Dakota State and bringing in all these guys that were at North Dakota State with him and doubting that they can do it at this level. And – we're in this feeling out period right now where we just kind of have to wait and give it time. And the, the one thing people should feel good about knowing is if Chris Kleiman thinks that this is not best for his football team moving forward, he will be able to cut bait. I mean, he fired one of his best friends in Courtney Messingham in a season where they won eight games and where you could, you could point out and justify it by saying, well, if you look at the numbers, the offense was still pretty good. He could tell that that, that Courtney Messingham was holding them back. If he gets to a point where he feels like Connor Riley is holding them back, Matt Wells will call the plays or somebody else will be brought in to do it because Chris Kleiman is well aware that he cannot waste Avery Johnson and he needs somebody that's going to put Avery Johnson in a position to succeed and put the team in a position to succeed. So I don't have any lost faith in Chris Kleiman. Chris Kleiman is great for K-State. He is a great coach in college football. And Joe Klanderman, I think he's proven himself enough. Defense can be really frustrating because they can play really well, but if you get popped for some big ones or you make some silly mistakes, they're going to stand out a lot more um, because you're not going to have as many opportunities to make up for it like an offense will. Connor Riley is the one where it's it's wait and see, and I think people are just going to have to be a little bit more patient and give this runway to him getting to the position he needs to be. Now, if they lose two more games, then – they probably need to start having some conversations because you mentioned four and four earlier. They can't lose three straight, especially with, you know, the games they have coming up home against Oklahoma state. Who's struggling. Got to win that road against Colorado. They're a terrible team. You got to win that. Like you're going to be in a position where you got to get this thing figured out, but that's where it sits right now. Uh, Any other thoughts? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Just to add one more thing on this offense. I I think the real key is figuring out the, the, best schemes for this offense in the passing game. I mean, K-State is still top 20 in almost every major advanced rushing metric, whether it be success rate or PPA or not great in explosiveness, but still top 50. So uh, part of me, and I I pose it on the board, uh, it's really pretty impressive how good we still run the ball with how bad our passing game is because our passing game is ranking in the 80s and 90s in most of the advanced metrics. And when, when you have that combination of, of a running game like that and you're running it 57% of the time so far this season and you're still having a lot of success running the football, and we did in the game. I think our success rate rushing the football in the first half was 
against BYU. So that in a, inability to get those plays in the passing game, even if some of them are – and maybe it's because some of them are forced – um, is what this offense needs to get corrected. I mean, you can't be this bad passing the football because eventually it's going to show up. And I think that's kind of what caught up with them a little bit at BYU at times too. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, uh, to close things out, BYU deserves a lot of shout-outs in a lot of different ways. Number one, Chris Kleiman, absolutely right in what he said about Kalani Sataki after the game. I think people confuse what I say about BYU and Kalani Sataki for not <laughs> yeah. liking him. I actually love him as a coach. Um, he just, you know, sometimes it's not going to pay off and it, it, it bites them and they have kind of been this medium thing. Yeah. They are a better team than anticipated. There's no doubt about it. That defense has some guys on it, even with tough situations. I know Bywater had to medically retire in the off season, like all this stuff going on. They're doing some things. Um, overall, I don't know, like they're 4-0 right now. I, I still think that they probably end up Seven wins might be their ceiling. Maybe they get to eight. I don't know their schedule off the top of my head, but they're a better team than anticipated. More than their team deserves a shout out, though. That crowd, atmosphere, stadium setting, and just the people in general of BYU. That by far and away best experience I've had on the road in the Big 12 because of the stadium and the environment and the presentation, but also that was an intimidating atmosphere and an awesome crowd without being nasty. Like, if you go to certain other places in the Big 12, they have to go to being nasty to, to generate some of that. I mean, and it, the same is true for K-State in basketball. Like, K-State, some of their intimidation factor is they are very nasty to KU when they come into town. Like, it would maybe be nicer if they weren't. They didn't have to turn to that. But they were phenomenal, and they deserve a lot of credit. And uh, I, will, I will not have a bad thing to say about – Provo, Utah, Lavelle Edwards Stadium, and those people. They, they deserve all the credit in the world. I think every single person wearing purple had a positive experience there, despite the fact that K-State got beat by 29. So that's, I guess, where we can end it. And uh, Drew can go watch the Chiefs before we <laughs> hopefully get on a plane, finally, after hours and hours of waiting. Uh, thanks for putting up with the airport. Thanks for putting up with a weird time. And uh, thanks for watching and listening. The KSO Sunday show will have more coverage on the Cats over at on 3 kstateonlinecom tonight and also then tomorrow because K-State will be back talking to everybody Monday press conferences. We'll also get to hear from Jerome Tang tomorrow afternoon, talk a little basketball with him. So a lot coming your way regarding K-State sports as uh, K-State football gears up for an 11 o'clock kick with Oklahoma State next Saturday. So for Drew Galloway, KSU fan, I'm Mason Grove. Thanks for watching and listening to the KSO.